بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يحده الله فلا مدل له وما يدلل فلا حادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار ما بعد Today's lesson is taken from the 44th chapter in Kitab al-Tawheed. The 44th chapter is titled by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab rahimahullah Bab Qawlu ma, qawlu ma sha Allah wa shi'at Bab Qawlu ma sha Allah wa shi'at Which is the chapter regarding the person who said regarding the, the, the statement that a person makes Whatever Allah wills and what you will. Whatever Allah wills and whatever you will. And so the Shaykh, uh, Shaykh Salih al Fuzan, he comments upon this chapter heading and he says that the Shaykh, Rahimullah, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, he began his uh, chapter heading, then he mentioned the chapter heading, chapter regarding the saying, whatever Allah wills and whatever you will. And the Shaykh says that meaning, Meaning that whatever has come in the book and the sunnah regarding the likes of this statement and regarding the prohibition that has come regarding the likes of this statement and the fact that it is that, the, that, that making the likes of this statement is shirk and setting up rivals along with Allah. Because the shaykh goes on to explain that if you were to say, if you were to make such a statement, whatever Allah wills and what you will, then you have basically set up partners. You, you, you've set up uh, or you, you've made comparisons and likenesses and you've, you've shared between the Creator and the creation in the issue of Al-Mashi'ah. Al-Mashi'ah, in the issue of the will, the quality or the, or the attribute of will, Allah's will. Because, and the reason for this is because you've used the particle of wow. Wow is a particle of a conjunction, meaning something which connects two, two things together. So when you say, Ma sha Allah, watch it, whatever Allah wills and what you will. Or in Arabic, it is in, in English, we would just simply say, whatever Allah wills and what you will. So the wow is similar to the and in English. So whenever a person uh, mentions this, then the Sheikh says that al wow. Al-Waw taqtadi al-tashriq That the Waw necessitates uh, um, making the two things share with each other. So in other words, this would be shirk in ar rububiyyah And of course, this is not permissible. And even if a person was to make such a statement but not really believe it in his heart, so if he was to say, whatever Allah wills and whatever you will, but in his heart he doesn't really believe what this statement necessitates, then still this would be the shirk in wording. It, it is a shirk fil lafz and this is still prohibited so how then would it be if a person actually believes it in his heart the affair then would be even more severe so then under this chapter heading the shaykh shaykh al islam muhammad bin abduhab rahimahullah he brings the hadith narrated by uh, qutayla and qutayla that uh, a jew came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said he said to him إِنَّكُمْ تُشْرِكُونَ That really, you commit shirk. تَقُولُونَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَشِئْتْ وَتَقُولُونَ وَالْقَعْبَةَ So he said, verily, you people, meaning you Muslims, you commit shirk because you say, مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَشِئْتْ Whatever Allah wills and what you will. And you say, وَالْقَعْبَةَ وَالْقَعْبَةَ Meaning, uh, وَالْقَعْبَةَ Meaning that you swear by the Kaaba. So the Shaykh comments upon the, this hadith and he says, uh, that Qutayla and Qutayla, Qutayla here is, she is uh, Qutayla bin Saifi al Ansariya, uh, and some people say that she is al Juhaniya, just pointing here to the to her uh, tribal origin, and uh, and so she narrates that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said 
that a Jew came to the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the Sheikh mentions the rest of the hadith, and then he says, the Sheikh Salah al Fawzan, he says that this Jew he knew that this is shirk. That he knew that this statement is shirk. And the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Islam he confirmed that and affirmed that and then he turned to his ummah he and then in fact the hadith continues actually the hadith continues for Amarahum al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then after this Jew came and mentioned what he mentioned, the, the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when you want to swear when you swear by something then you should say Warabbul Kaaba. Warabbul Kaaba. So instead of saying Wal Kaaba, Warabbul Kaaba by the Lord of the Kaaba. And you should say, and that they should say, Masha Allah, Thumma Shi'it. Right? So instead of saying Masha Allah, Wa Shi'it, the Messenger commanded them to say, Masha Allah, Thumma Shi'it. So replacing, replacing the Wa with the Thumma. That whatever Allah wills, then what you will. Narrated by An Nasai. So anyway, going back to the Shaykh's explanation of this uh, hadith, he said that this Yahudi, he knew that this was shirk, and the messenger, the Prophet ﷺ, he confirmed this, corroborated this, and then he directed his ummah uh, to change this wording and to replace it with an, another wording which would actually be correct. So therefore, when... So, so, so in other words, that his ummah should say, وَرَبُّ Kaaba, وَرَبُّ Kaaba. So now swearing by the Lord of the Kaaba. And Masha Allah Thumma Shi'at. So the Shaykh explains that when he said to them, Rabbul Kaaba, of course, this is Allah, and the Kaaba is the Bayt of the, the, the bait of Allah. So therefore, here the Shaykh says that swearing is not to be done by way of the Kaaba, but by the Lord of the Kaaba. And this is a correct alternative which is devoid of any type of shirk. And the Shaykh says that when making uh, or when swearing by way of the Kaaba is shirk and is prohibited, then how can it be? Then how 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 can how is it then with swearing by other than the Kaaba from the created things? You know, uh, the Sheikh asked this question. So meaning it is it is it is you know it it, it is likewise prohibited and more severe. And uh, also the saying of the Messenger to his Ummah that they should say Masha Allah thumma shi'at that whatever Allah wills then what you will, then the Shaykh says that this is a correct wording. Because um, because the Shaykh says that the, 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 the wording used or the particle used is thumma instead of waw, instead of wa. Because wa, as we said before, the waw is, signifies the, the sharing between two things. Right? you making two things equal with respect to a quality or an attribute, which is in this case the Mashia, Allah's will. And as for Thumma, then Thumma the Shaykh says is for Tartib, Tartib, which is an order. The first is Tashriq, using a Waw is Tashriq, making two things share in the same quality. And a Tartib, which is the Thumma, which is for Tartib, means that you are making the Mashia, the will of the creation, to follow the will of the Creator. In the way that it's mentioned. And this is because the Shaykh says that the, the, the creation do not will except as Allah wills. So therefore their will follows the will of Allah and it is not an independent will. It's not independent from Allah. And this is the difference between the two words. So the first word, Masha Allah, wash it, whatever Allah wills and what you will, here we are equating in essence. This is equating and, and, and sharing between. The will of the Creator and the will of the creation. But as for Masha Allah, Thumma Shi'at, whatever Allah wills, then what you will, then, um, you know, this is this. The, the first wording was Shirk, and the second wording is actually Tawheed. Then the Shaykh says that in respect to the issue of Mashia, the issue of the will itself, the Shaykh says that, uh, that the creation do have a will. The creation does have a will, and that this will and that th this belief that we have in the will of the creation is different to the belief of the Jabariya, the astray Jabariya, an astray sect. And the Jabariya, they say that the creation doesn't have a will, rather, people are compelled to uh, perform actions, right? They are compelled to disbelieve 
they are compelled to sin, they are compelled to a shirk without having any choice. And uh, as the Sheikh explains, like the, the famous example that, that is given to explain the view of the Jabriya, it's like basically if you have uh, um, like if you have like a plant or something and the wind blows the plant, so really the plant is not in essence moving of its own accord, but it's being blown by the wind. So in other words, it's being, it's being compelled to move. And so in this manner do they describe the actions of the servants, in that the servants are compelled to perform their actions and they are not from their own choice. And the Sheikh says that if, if this was the case, then no one would have deserved to be punished for their sins. And likewise, no one would have deserved to be rewarded for their obedience. And so this is uh, the belief of the Jabariya. And at the other extreme, we have the belief of the Mu'tazila. The belief of the Mu'tazila. And they said that the servant has a will, that the servant has an independent will, which doesn't have any connection to the will of Allah. So in other words, a person can commit uh, disbelief, he can commit sins outside of the will of Allah and without the will of Allah. Because the, as they say, his will, the will of the, the, the servant is actually independent. And self, it's like self-contained and independent from the will of Allah. And high is Allah and lofty is Allah from what they say. Because this, what this would mean is that there occurs, there, there, there occurs certain, you know, those things um, in the creation of Allah which he doesn't actually will, right? which he doesn't actually will. And in essence, this, as, as the people have said, that this signifies, in essence, that there are two creators. Uh, but but uh, as, as, as the, the, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah have explained, that the Mu'tazila, uh, this, this necessitates that there are two creators, uh, one of evil, one of good. And that this is like the saying of the Majus. But the Shaykh, Shaykh says that this, um, that, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so the saying of the Mu'tazila is that basically there occurs in the creation of Allah and in the dominion of Allah that which he doesn't actually will. And the Shaykh says that this reasoning isn't, isn't correct. Right? Because what the Mu'tazila argue is that Allah can never will that which is evil. Rather the servants, it's from their own will and their own independent will that, that, it, that they perform to do evil. But as for Allah, he doesn't actually uh, uh, you know, choose, choose to, do, uh, to, to will those things. Uh, and the Sheikh says that this doesn't necessarily follow because uh, because it's not it's not the case that Allah should love everything that He wills. Right? It's, it's not the case that Allah should necessarily love everything that He wills to occur because we know that Allah He wills for disbelief to occur for the disbelief of a disbeliever, and at the same time we know that He doesn't love this. He doesn't like this action. He doesn't like disbelief from His servants, and likewise He. But he, he decrees it for, and he, he, brings, he, wills it, uh, he wills it, and he brings it into existence. He creates this disbelief for a far-reaching wisdom. And this is to, in order to test and to, to put people to, tr people to trial. And because otherwise, if Allah, if, I, if Allah had wanted, he could have quite easily have guided the whole of mankind if he so wanted. And the Sheikh, the Sheikh makes reference here to uh, an ayah. Low, or to, to, to a meaning which is found in the ayah often that if Allah had so willed he would have guided the whole of mankind however due to his mercy um, he wanted there to be differences between them and for this reason he willed for there to be disbelief and whatever else is like that uh, uh, in, in, in these affairs then uh, the sheikh goes on to discuss the next hadith which is the hadith from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, anhu who said that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he said ma sha Allah wa shi'at again the same statement whatever Allah wills and whatever you will so he said faqala aj'altani lillahi nidda have you made me a rival with Allah or an equal with Allah bal ma sha Allah wahdahu MashaAllah, wahdahu rather, it is whatever Allah willed alone. So the Shaykh comments upon this hadith and uh, 
He says that when the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ajal tani lillahi nida," "Qul ma sha Allah, ma sha Allah wahda," that when the Messenger said, "Have you made me a rival with Allah?" Rather say whatever Allah wills alone. So he says that a nid, a nid. The meaning of a nid here is someone who is a likeness or a resemblance or an equal. Right? These these terms. This is what is meant by nid, meaning. So so what the messenger means is he says that have you made me uh, as a resemblance to Allah, one who resembles Allah, or a likeness of Allah? Or one who shares with him in in, 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 in in his will. And then the messenger commanded that this wording should be ch- changed with an alternative word, with a word that signifies Tawheed, which is Ma Sha Allah Wahdahu. Ma Sha Allah, whatever Allah wills, alone. And when we, in, in, in the Shaykh points out that when we look at these two hadith together, the previous hadith, where the messenger said, "Ma sha Allah thumma shi'it," that a person should should say, "Ma sha Allah thumma shi'it," whatever Allah wills, then what you will. And when we look at this hadith, "Ma sha Allah, Ma sha Allah wahda," the Sheikh points out that here, the messenger is indicating that which is best, that which is more perfect to be said, which is "Ma sha Allah, Ma sha Allah wahda." That is obviously the best thing to say. However, when the messenger said in the previous hadith that you should say Ma Sha Allah Thumma Shi'it, that was just merely an explanation of what is permissible to say, right? To say, to say Ma Sha Allah Thumma Shi'it, that's permissible to say, and it doesn't contain any opposition with uh, to 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 Tawheed. But as for saying Ma Sha Allah Wahda, whatever Allah wills alone, then that is obviously the most the perfect, the, the you know, the, the perfect thing to say. So therefore, we find that there isn't any conflict or any contradiction between the two hadith. Rather, one is taken to mean uh, to refer to something which is permissible, and the second is to re- is, is is re- refers to something which is more perfect. And the Sheikh says that this here, like this particular hadith here, is from the angle of closing off all of the doors and the avenues that lead to shirk, because because. The, the Prophet ﷺ has basically prohibited from shirk and likewise he's prohibited from the ways that lead towards it as well because even if a person uh, even if a person was to utter such a wording like we said when he said Masha Allah wash it whatever Allah wills and what you w- will then if a person even if he wasn't to believe in it make the statement without believing in it then still the fact that it's used and the fact that people employ this word it's a means to um, it's a it's a means that will eventually lead the people to to believing that statement, you know, when when, when it becomes widespread and used amongst people. So therefore, the wording is still prohibited, even though it's not, even though people don't actually believe in what the meaning might entail. So in other words, the sh- saying that this is uh, prohibiting something which is said on the tongues of the people, but it, which which might not necessarily have. Uh, 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 which the people might not necessarily believe in the hearts to contain the meaning that it might entail, but still, the fact that it's found amongst the people, it could still be a way of eventually, uh, you know, when when ignorance is found, that people might start believing, you know, in 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 in, in the belief which is which is, which is prohibited, uh, which underlies that statement. So therefore, it's from the bab, it's from the angle of cutting off and closing all of the doors. And then the Sheikh points out that these two ahadith that we've just looked at, there are a number of benefits. There are quite a few benefits that we can derive from these two ahadith, some, some mighty benefits. And he says, he says, first of all, the first benefit is what the Sheikh himself has mentioned, rahimullah, in, in the notes at the end of the, the chapter, uh, which is that sometimes a person can actually understand something even though he might have a desire like uh, 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 even meaning even though he might be misguided it means that a person can still understand the issues but nevertheless he's still misguided so he explains that he in this case that this Yehudi this uh, Jew who was you know despite the, the despite him being uh, as the Sheikh says Yehudian 
maghduban alayhi then nevertheless he still understood that this is from shirk right he still understood that this statement is from shirk because really the reason why he came to the prophet peace be upon him and to make that remark when he said innakum tushrikun that really you people meaning you muslims you commit shirk because you say mashallah wa shi'at when he, when he came to say the statement he wanted to come and in actual fact belittle the muslim ummah that's why that's why he made that remark he wanted to come and to belittle uh, to the, this ummah however despite this the the, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the messenger ali sallam he accepted this this uh, uh, you know this this observation that was made he accepted this observation and then he directed his ummah and he d- directed them to that which is correct meaning that they should say mashallah thumma shi'at this is the first benefit the second benefit is in this hadith is to accept and affirm the truth from whoever it came from you affirm the truth from wh- wh- whomever it comes from even if it is from an enemy and when he speaks the truth then the truth is the truth you accept it from from whoever it comes the third benefit is that the shaykh has indicated here that the yahud despite being upon their misguidance they understand what is shirk they understand what is shirk they know what is shirk the jews know what is shirk on the other hand some of the so called scholars of this ummah are those who are taken as scholars they don't actually understand shirk and for this reason you find them permitting the permissibility of worshiping the graves and the tombs and they don't show any rejection towards it and they say that this is a form of tawassul seeking nearness to Allah by way of the righteous people and that it is not shirk or they might say that this action only represents love of the righteous people and they you know they enjoy the, the you know they encourage and li- enjoy the likes of these or they encourage the likes of these affairs and they they see or they view that it is not from shirk uh, despite the fact that it is shirk which expels from the religion so therefore what was mentioned by this uh, jew to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding the statement ma sha allah wa shi'at then in reality it is um shirk asghar which doesn't actually expel a person from the religion right when it said ma sha allah wa shi'at it's a shirk in al-lafz the shirk in wording which doesn't expel from the religion um um unless of course the person actually believes in the remarks that a person's will is synonymous with Allah's will then obviously that would be major shirk but in but the wording in and of itself is uh, a minor shirk which doesn't actually expel from the from from you know from from the religion and so the jew he understood this and he w- was aware of this and he observed this and at the same time you find yet and, and you know and he made a note about it but at the same time you find that some of these people who ascribe to knowledge from this umma they don't actually reject against even the major shirk which expels from the fold of islam you know which which we find is shaking the which, which is shaking the muslim umma today uh the islamic world today you know by way of this worship of other than allah and so on and so forth and also another benefit is that in this umma there are some people who have a greater understanding that the, the, sorry that there are so, that, 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 that this jew had a great or that some of the jews have a greater understanding than some of those scholars who ascribe themselves to islam and this is what this hadith points to as well we ask allah for pardon and uh, safety as the sheikh uh, supplicates then he says the fourth benefit which is the prohibition of saying ma sha allah wa shi'at so this is a fourth benefit that is found in these hadith that it is prohibited to say whatever allah wills and whatever you will and likewise it is prohibited to make or to swear by the kaaba and likewise by extension by other things from the creation because to swear by other than allah is shirk because it is a form of venerating and aggrandizing and glorifying other than allah and no one deserves to be alhamdulillah no one deserves to be glorified and uh, uh, praised in the manner or venerated in the in, in, in the most complete manner except for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also uh, what it contains the, 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 in, in, in this hadith is that to make uh, to swear by other than allah is obviously shirk because the messenger the prophet ali sallam when the yahudi said when he said innakum tushrikun so the yahudi began, began his statement he said innakum tushrikun saying that really you commit shirk 
And then he explained what that was. He said that you say whatever Allah wills and whatever you whatever you will. And they say by the Kaaba. So the messenger affirmed and corroborated, yes, that this is that, 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 that this is shirk because the Yehudi said, Inna kum tu shirkun. The fifth benefit is that uh, that whenever whenever that what this hadith indicates is that whenever the people are prohibited from something, then they are to be given an alternative to that thing. Right? So when you prohibit something from someone, then if there's a better alternative, then they are to be directed towards that. As the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith, when you know when when he said that the, that rather than saying uh, wal Kaaba by the Kaaba, rather it should be said wa Rabbul Kaaba. So instead of just prohibiting them from saying the thing outright, instead of saying okay, don't say Masha Allah wa Shaykh and don't say um, uh, wal Kaaba, and just stopping there and we're making that a complete prohibition, because there's an alternative, then the messenger directed to them them to that better alternative, which is. Masha Allah, thumma shi'at, whatever Allah will, then what you will, and likewise, wa rabbul ka'aba, by the Lord of the Ka'aba. So therefore, the Shaykh says, whoever, whoever comes with the prohibition of something, or whoever declares something unlawful, or prohibits something, and at the same time there is to be found a, a, a good alternative, a correct, a sound alternative, then he is to direct the people towards that, whenever that situation arises, just as the Prophet Sallallahu did in, 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 in this uh, example. The sixth benefit is that in the hadith of Ibn Abbas uh, regarding the man who said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shi'at and then the messenger said Aja'altani lillahi nidda that have you made me a rival with Allah then this shows, this indicates the inkar, the inkar al-munkar the prohibition of the evil because the Prophet Sallallahu he rejected this man, you know, he showed rejection upon this man, especially in the case when this situation was in relation to shirk, which can damage a person's tawhi, uh, aqidah, uh, because in, in this situation it's not permissible to be silent regarding it. Rather, it should be explained, it's obligatory that it be explained, and you know, that, that he make a notification regarding this. And this is what this hadith indicates, uh, and likewise, uh, this meaning here. Uh, in this, the meaning that we get in this hadith that you know, have you made me a rival with Allah? Is is it's actually the tafsir? It is the same tafsir that's given by Ibn Abbas to the verse which occurs in Surah Al-Baqarah at the beginning. Fala taj'alu lillahi andada wa antum ta'lamun. Fala taj'alu lillahi andada wa antum ta'lamun. Do not make for Allah rivals or equals whilst you know. And regarding this, Ibn Abbas said that what this, what this ayah means is that when a person says, for example, if it hadn't been for Allah and for so-and-so, if it hadn't been for Allah and for so-and-so, or if it hadn't been for this dog, the, the guard dog, then the thief would not have come to us. If it hadn't been for this, you know, like this animal in, in, in the pond or this duck or whatever, then the, 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 in the water, then the thief would not have come to us. The likes of these statements. So here, Ibn Abbas, like he, he made tafsir of this verse, فَلَا تَجْعَلُ لِلَّهِ andada by the likes of these affairs. When a person says, if it hadn't been for Allah and so-and-so, or if it hadn't been for such and such thing, then such and such thing. So, you know, so, 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 so therefore, uh, if, if we look at the tafsir of Ibn Abbas and the examples he's given, and then we look at this hadith in which the Messenger ﷺ said, you know, have you made me a rival or equal with, with Allah? Just because a person said, whatever Allah Allah wills and whatever you will, then uh, it shows that the likes of these remarks and the likes of these statements, and this and this statement specifically here that we're dealing with, Masha Allah wa shit, that this is setting up rivals alongside Allah. All of this entails the setting up of rivals alongside Allah. Even though it is still from the man shirk, this is still from the man shirk because this is still the shirk in wording, the shirk fil laf, the shirk in wording, which is from the man shirk. Then we go to the final text, which is brought by Shaykh al Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, and this is a hadith in which At Tufail, 
At-Tufail is the stepbrother of Aisha radiallahu anha. Tufail is the stepbrother of Aisha radiallahu anha, a stepbrother from her mother's side. And he said that I saw I saw in my dream uh, a group from the uh, a group from the Jews and I said to them verily you are the people you are the people Mean, meaning this is a form of praise verily you are the people if only you didn't say Uzair is the son of Allah so they said to him the Jews replied to him and you wa antum la antum al qawm verily you you are the people like again, this is like a praise of the of the Muslim nation. If only you did, if only you didn't say Ma Sha Allah or Sha Muhammad. And then he says, then I passed by a group of Christians, and I said to them, Inna kum la antum al qawm. Really, you are the people. If only you didn't say that Al Masih is the son of Allah. So they replied, the Christians replied, وَإِنَّكُمْ لَأَنْتُمُ الْقَوْمِ That really you are the people. لَوْلَا أَنَّكُمْ تَقُولُونَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ شَاءَ مُحَمَّدٍ Really you are the people. If only you didn't say whatever Allah wills and whatever Muhammad wills. And so then he said that when I walk in the morning, I informed, I informed a number of people about it. And then I came to the Prophet ﷺ and I informed him about it. And then he said, have you told other people about this? And I said, yes. So then, he, uh, the messenger praised Allah, uh, and he praised Allah, and he extolled him, and then he said, Amma ba'd, to proceed, a very tufail has seen something uh, in his dream, which he informed those people that he informed, and really, uh, uh, really you say, you, you say, you people say something, but, Something pro- prevents me from prohibiting it upon you, right? That you people, you say something. There's a phrase that you say, but there's something that withholds me back from actually prohibiting you from it. So do not say, do not say, Ma sha Allah wa sha Muhammad, but say, but, but say, Ma sha Allah wahdahu. Rather say whatever Allah wills alone. So concerning this hadith, then first of all, Sheikh he explains that at tufail uh, Sheikh Saleh al Fuzan he says, At Tufail is At Tufail bin Abdullah bin uh, Sakhbarat bin Sakhbarat al Azdi. And this is an ascription to Al Azd, which is uh, a well known Arabian tribe. And the father of, uh, of uh, Tufail is Abdullah bin, Sakh, bin Sakhbara. And Abdullah bin Sakhbara, he actually came to Mecca. He traveled to Mecca before the sending of the Messenger وسلم, and he formed an alliance with Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Abu Bakr as Siddiq. This was something that you would find in the days of ignorance, in the days of Jahiliyyah, where people would make uh, what's called a brotherly alliance, where one person would, would become an ally to another, and he would defend him and aid him and support him and give him sanctuary and everything else that, that entailed that. And even if he died, if one of them died, then the other would inherit from him. And so therefore, uh, this issue of this uh, alliance and confederacy, it became such that, the, you know, it, it, it became such that it was as if each of the allies were basically part and parcel of the same family. You know, so then when, it, when Islam came, these forms of alliances were prohibited, uh, were, were abrogated, and likewise, the inheritance that, that a person took from his uh, ally, then that was negated as well. Allah uh, uh, abolished that as well. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأُولُوا الْأَرْحَامِ بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْدُ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Sorry, وَأُولُوا الْأَرْحَامِ وَأُولُوا الْأَرْحَامِ بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْدُ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ That those, the, the, the people of, uh, of the, meaning the relationship by way of the womb, then... Uh, that is more befitting uh, in the book of Allah. And so therefore Allah made the inheritance to be only for the relation, relationship by way of the, you know, the, 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 the woo, meaning the, the actual uh, proper relationships, and w- which is the relatives as opposed to the allies. 
And then what happened was that Abdullah bin Sakhbara, he died, he passed away. And his wife used to be called Um uh, Um Ruman. Um Ruman. And so what happened was Abu Bakr as Siddiq uh, an, anhu, he married her. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, he had two children, Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr and Aisha bin Abi Bakr, who was the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. And for this reason, At-Tufail therefore became the brother, the, 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 sorry, the stepbrother of Aisha through the uh, mother's side. So anyway, At-Tufail said that I saw in my dream, Ra'ito, uh, meaning in, in, my, in my dream, and the Sheikh says that uh, Ar-Ru'ya, that Meaning, seeing things in one dream is true. It's true and real. This is something which happens, and it is also one forty-sixth of prophethood. It is also one forty-sixth of prophethood. And the Sheikh says that Ibn Al Qayyim, rahimahullah, has mentioned in his book Al Ruh that uh, Al Ru'ya is of three types. There are three types of Al Ru'ya, meaning those things that a person sees in his dream. The first of them is Al Ru'ya, which is Haq the true vision or the, or the true you know the true vision in the dream and this is when uh this is what, 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 this is when the angel of the dream comes you know he comes to the the person who's sleeping and he shows the person who's sleeping uh by way by way of his in, in his dream certain things certain affairs or certain strange or uh, you know affairs that he sees and then he wakes up and you know he's, he's obviously seen this vision in his in, in 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 his dream, and then what happens is that something occurs exactly as he saw it in his dream, right? So this is called the true the ru'ya, which is which which is haq. This is the first type of dream. Second type of dream is something which comes from the shaitan. So this is when a person he's uh, sleeping, he goes to sleep. He didn't he didn't mention Allah when he went to sleep. He didn't recite ayatul kursi. He didn't recite Surat Al-Ikhlas and the Mu'awwad uh, and he didn't seek refuge with, uh, in Allah from the accursed shaitan and you know he didn't come with any kind of uh, supplications which are legislated at the time of sleep so that such a person then shaitan will pounce upon him and he will make his dream you know like his sleep to be like uh, murky and muddy and you know just confused and disturbed and so on and so forth and he will make him see certain things which are false. You know, they, he'll see certain things in his dream which are false, which don't have any basis. And he only shows him these things in order to, again, to confuse and to confound and disturb him in his sleep. Uh, and the reason for this is, obviously, he didn't protect himself by, uh, the, you know, by, by seeking refuge in Allah from the shaitan before going to sleep. The third type, the third type is the hadith, is, is the is what's called the hadith nafs which is that that internal speaking that a person does that when he's you know when he you know those like things that he thinks about in his mind and things that he thinks about through the day in his mind um, while while he's awake he reflects upon them in his mind uh, or it could be that something's on his mind something concerns him something's on his mind so when he goes to sleep then these same things come to him in the form of his dream and you know uh, the, the, the same things will then come and come come to him in one form or another in his dream, because obviously they were they were they were, they were, they were while he was awake he was thinking about them, and this is what's called uh, hadith or nafs, and uh, the sheikh says that this is really just uh, it's just like dreams that a person has um, uh, as a result of this. So then he, the sheikh continues with the saying of Tufail when he said. That it's as if uh, um, a group, like a group of the Jews, came. Uh, a nafar, a nafar in al Yahud. A nafar meaning al Jama'a, meaning a group. And al Yahud, the Sheikh says that al Yahud, when we speak of al Yahud, that, 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 that they are the followers of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Originally, they are the followers of Musa alayhi salam. And there are two viewpoints to explain as to why they, they've been called al Yahud. The first reason, or the first viewpoint, uh, is that they are called Al-Yahud because of their ascription to Yahuda ibn Ya'qub. Yahuda, the son of Ya'qub. Yahuda, one of the sons of Ya'qub. So therefore, from that they were called Yahud, you know, Al-Yahud. Um, 
this is one. And the second viewpoint is that the reason why they were called Yahud is based upon the saying of Musa alayhi salam when he said, uh, regard to Allah, Inna hudna ilayka. Inna hudna ilayka. Hudna. Meaning that we have repented to you. Hudna. Hudna, which has which been taken from the word al-hawd. Al-hawd meaning tawbah. Uh, a tawbah, making repentance and returning back to Allah. <coughs> so, this is what they were called initially, al-Yahud, uh, those people who were the followers of Musa. And then after this, the word Yahud became, um, uh, uh, was applied also to those who ascribed themselves to, uh, you know, who claimed that they followed Musa. Even if they were opposed, in opposition to him in many, many things, and they lied upon him in many things, and they invented into the deen of Allah, you know, many, many uh, repugnant things, such as shirk with Allah, and speaking about the, you know, speaking regarding uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So it became, the, the name Yahud became used to apply to all such people. Then the hadith continues that I said to them, verily, you are the people. Meaning that this was a kind of praise for them because originally they were upon a correct religion. And then he says, if only you didn't say Uzair is the son of Allah. Because they used to ascribe a son to Allah, Uzair, and Uzair was the name of a man amongst them. Some people say that he was a prophet, and other people say that he was a righteous man. And an, an alim, uh, a scholar um, from amongst them. Uh, so then, in the hadith, it continues that they, meaning the Jews, they replied, replying back to Tufail, that verily you are the people. So now they are praising the Muslims. But if only, if only you didn't say, MashaAllah, Husha'a Muhammad. And here, when we look at this here, uh, what, what was said here, the Sheikh mentions like a benefit, which is that sometimes a person might see the mistakes of someone else, but he doesn't see the mistake of his own self. Right. So in other words, in other words, that he pointed out something about the Jews that they uh, worship Uzair and make him the son of Allah, but at the same time, he didn't recognize the sh the, the, the Shirk inherent in the wording, Masha Allah, Husha Muhammad. That sometimes a person sees the fault of someone else, but he doesn't see the fault in himself. He says that this is this like this is what this uh, contains as well. This it contains this benefit, even if uh, sometimes his mistake might or his flaw, his error might be bigger than the error of those people besides him. And the Sheikh says there's another benefit in this as well, which is to accept the truth from whomever it came from. To accept the truth from whomever it came from. And so then the Hadith continues, and At-Tufail says that I came across I came across some a group from the Jews, uh, Christians, and and Nasara are the followers of Isa, the original followers of Isa, and the reason why they've been called Nasara is due to the uh, place or the town which is called An Nasira, An Nasira, which is in the land of uh, Palestine, and this is one viewpoint. And the other viewpoint is that they've been called Nasara due to the due to them saying, Nahnu Ansarullah. As Allah says about them, Nahnu Ansarullah, that we are the servants of Allah. We are the help sorry, we are the helpers of Allah. Ansarullah. So from this they were called Nasara. So in any case, the Shaykh says that uh, at Tufail continues and he said that you know he said to them that really you are the people in Nakum and Antumul Qum. If only you didn't say Al Masih is the son of Allah. And Al Masih um uh Isa al Islam has been called Al Masih because he's the one who touches the people uh, who have an affliction and they are healed by the permission of Allah. So, An Nasara, the, these, these Christians, they exaggerated concerning Al Masih just like the Jews exaggerated concerning Uzair. But then the Christians replied in the same manner that the Jews replied. That, that Jews replied. So, the next morning when he woke at Tufail, he went and informed the Prophet Ali Sallam, and you know the Prophet Ali Sallam asked him, "Did you inform anyone?" And he said, "Yes." And so the Messenger praised Allah, and then he extolled him, and then he said, "Amma bad, amma bad." So this shows the Sheikh says that from this we can we can see from this here that there is an evidence here 
of first of all of the, of, of 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 praising Allah and extolling Allah before you begin to speak. That this is something which is found in the Sharia. It's legislated in the Sharia. And this and uh, then the Sheikh brings another hadith, uh, a hadith which is actually da'if, that every affair which doesn't begin uh, with the praise of Allah is is deficient. Uh, And then he says, for this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he began, uh, um, his, his, he, he, he began the book, the, the Qur'an, with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, the Shaykh says that, um, that also in the statement, also in the saying of the Messenger is, the recommended nature of, be, of also beginning with, Amma Ba'd, of saying, Amma Ba'd, of first of all praising Allah, and then secondly saying amma ba'd because this is because uh, this phrasing amma ba'd is a means of transferring from the initial praise to the actual subject that a person is going to uh, speak of and then the messenger said that verily at tufail saw something like in his dream which he and he informed those whom he informed and verily you people you say a word but something prevents me from that i should outright forbid you from it now, what, what, what is it that was preventing the Prophet ﷺ? The thing that was preventing the Prophet ﷺ was al-haya. Al-haya meaning modesty. Because, because the, the reason why he, he didn't want to go and outright prohibit it was because there was nothing that had come from revelation regarding this thing. Right? Nothing from revelation had come prohibiting this thing. So he didn't want to say outright prohibit it because obviously from his modesty he didn't want to say something that the revelation hadn't come, come down with respect to so, so therefore he said do not say whatever Allah willed and whatever Muhammad willed but rather say MashaAllah Wahdahu whatever Allah willed alone so therefore again we see again that when he informed the people of the mistake in the statement he also pointed them to an alternative which is um, you know the, 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 the uh, a better alternative which is to say whatever Allah wills alone so this story then uh, contains a number of benefits which we'll finish with and from the benefits are that a ru'ya that the dream that a person sees is true and real it is true and real um, and the the, 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 the sheikh says that it's, it's, it's not permissible to lie regarding one's uh, you know, to re- lie regarding one's dreams because there is a very severe uh, prohibition or a very severe threat concerning that. The second benefit is that sometimes a person can understand something even though he might have a desire with him or a misguidance with him. Like, for example, the Jews and the Christians, you know, like they, 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 like in this incident in the story, you know, they're, they're upon Hawa uh, with respect to the Muslimin, they have desires uh, against the Muslimin. But even then, they even even they they noticed this issue, and they didn't notice is they didn't notice this issue, or point it out, because they love the truth and they're so eager and desirous of tawheed. No, it's because they wanted to belittle the Muslimin, that you people you know, there's good in you, but you you know you say such and such. It was it was a kind of belittlement of, of. Uh, uh, of the Muslimin, and you know, to, to point out their faults and their mis, you know, their, their shortcomings, um, even though they themselves have greater shortcomings. And the third benefit is to accept the truth from whomever it comes, even if he is an enemy, because the truth is the lost property of a believer, and to return back to the truth is an excellence, is an excellent virtue. The fourth benefit is in the hadith there is an evidence that whenever someone prohibits something or you know, forbid something and there's to be found an alternative then he should mention the alternative and direct the people to the alternative as we've seen in these hadith that the messenger alayhi salam, alayhi salam, he prohibited from saying MashaAllah wa sha'a Muhammad and he brought with a, 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 an alternative which is MashaAllah wahdahu the fifth benefit is that uh, that the statement MashaAllah wa sha'a Muhammad or MashaAllah wa sha'a Fulan or MashaAllah wa sha'it all of these affairs it makes no difference who we are speaking about or to or whom we are speaking about whether it's like a prophet from amongst the prophets or anyone
then this phrase is shirk with Allah. It is shirk with Allah. And it's, it is obligatory to abandon it. But again, as we've pointed out before, it is only the minor shirk. It is the minor shirk. Um, you know, so, so when a person doesn't mean its meaning, you know, then it is shirk in wording. So therefore, it's, as the Shaykh says, it's obligatory to abandon it and to avoid it and to keep away from it. And finally, the sixth benefit is that it, it is not permissible to exaggerate and to go to extremes regarding the Prophet wasallam, and to start making him as, as, as a partner or sharing with Allah in anything, you know, uh, or to supplicate to him or to seek rescue from him besides Allah. Because all of this is uh, because the Prophet ﷺ, he prohibited that it even be said whatever Allah wills and whatever Muhammad wills. So if he prohibited even that, then how much more would it be forbidden you know, for those other affairs that, that, that we find that the people are upon from the various types of exaggeration and you know, extremism and so on and so forth. So with that, the, we finish the lesson uh, here insha'Allah ta'ala and we'll uh, stop there. Uh, next week we'll begin a different topic insha'Allah ta'ala.